Well, hello everybody. I'm Pastor Derek Schneider from History Makers Academy and History Makers Society. I want to talk to you today a little bit about organized righteousness. Organized righteousness. And why is it a secret to impacting society? You know, today everybody is looking for the way to reach more people, or we should be, the way for our churches to impact culture, to impact society. And Oftentimes, when we don't know how to do something, we resort back to what we know. We resort back to simply praying and waiting for God to come down and impact society. Or we, uh, we just keep prophesying that one day it's going to happen. One day God is going to change our nation. One day all things are going to work out. And these are natural human emotions and natural things that we gravitate towards. And prophecy is good. And God uses prophecy, and prayer is, of course, the most important, our foundation of prayer. But when you understand sociology and the ability to transform a culture, shift a culture, or shift a nation, there's something more required beyond just prayer. I didn't say that prayer can't change a nation. I said there's something more required. Now, I want to I'm help you to understand this concept of organized righteousness and why it's so important. What is organized righteousness and how can it impact and transform a society? Well, to understand organized righteousness, it's important to understand organized crime. <laughs> you know, why does organized crime transform a society the wrong direction? And really, how is organized crime able to flourish? Imagine in a society or a place like Canada, there's sex trafficking and the sex trade is, is very predominant here in our own nation and society frowns upon it. The police are fighting to stop it. And uh, it's just something that you, you wonder, why do certain things flourish in certain cultures and societies that are so of disdain and, and unwanted. Well, it's because that kind of crime and corruption is organized. The secret is right there in the terminology, organized crime. When something is organized in an appropriate and systematic way, anything is possible. And we see that even with the Tower of Babel, when people come together in unity, even a small group of people, and they go to build in an organized way, an entire society can be changed. <laughs> and that's exciting because the opposite can be true too with organized good or organized righteousness. When a unified people come together, even a small organized group of thoughtful, committed citizens, they are the ones that change the world. In fact, I'm sorry, church, but uh, great church services are not actually enough to transform a society. And even many churches planted in, in places are not always enough. And we know that because some nations, like even Jamaica, for example, uh, the most churches per capita of any nation in the world, yet the nation still greatly wrestles with systemic poverty, uh, systemic corruption, fatherlessness, all of that. The presence of churches even is not really what transforms a society or disciples a nation. It's the presence of sons and daughters of the king, sons and daughters, real believers, who will come together in an organized way and create systems. <laughs> and without going too deep into that concept, systems in a society actually hold certain principles or, or ideologies in place that cause or produce a culture. That's the best way to say it. So you'll have certain even demonic ideologies, ideas that come from the demonic kingdom that are placed in the minds of leaders or organized individuals, and then they create systems that not only hold those ideologies in place and allow them to flourish in a culture or, or a country, but they actually become trends. They, ask, they actually become, you know, systemic and, and, and filtrate, filter down into every aspect of society, education, business, politics, everything. And before long, that culture or that nation begins to reflect a kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom of darkness. And right now there's a momentum in Canada heading the wrong direction. And this is why we as believers must come together in an organized way and create new systems based on kingdom principles that we know cause nations to prosper. 
The Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness causes a nation to, th to thrive. But if we don't organize it, if we withhold righteousness and keep it within the four walls of the church and we don't send it out into the streets like rivers of life, but in an organized, systematic, strategic way, then the kingdom of God cannot become systemic within a society uh, and, and a, the culture cannot shift. So what am I saying? When we talk about organized righteousness, when you organize good and we organize things that we do beyond the four walls, the culture and our cities and our nation can actually begin to experience this precious kingdom that we all love and appreciate so much and that has the power to win a nation. That's why Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come in Canada as it is in heaven. We have the right we have the equipment. We have God has done everything He can do to 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 give us the ability to go and reach nations for Him. So, a couple examples of this: when we talk about organizing righteousness, many people ask, "What does that look like?" I remember when God removed the glory, so to speak, from some of our services, and I found myself preaching to the same people each week and. Great things were happening, and we had revival meetings, we had prayer meetings, we had, a, we had all of that. But I can't say that our city or our nation were being discipled. I can't say that I was really fulfilling the totality of the Great Commission. And, you know, I, I got into waiting on revival, prophesying revival, praying for revival, but I found the waiting just got too long as I was watching souls and people perish and die and go to an eternity lost without Christ. And I realized that I had to do something about it. I discovered that it, it is a going gospel. And uh, I discovered that if we could train and equip and organize laborers in a certain strategic way, we could change the world. We could change our nation. And that's what I began to do because I saw the, the heathen were doing it, the unsaved were organized and and affecting change in Parliament, and affecting change in media, and affecting change in all the seven sociological mountains, I thought, why is we as believers are not doing this? Why are we just praying about it? And uh, I began to come face to face and confront the awful reality that the laborers weren't ready. The laborers were good prayer warriors. The laborers were good church attendants. The laborers attended many conferences. The laborers knew how to get a touch from God. All of that is good. The laborers even know how to experience the revival fire of God. But our laborers were not necessarily trained and equipped properly to go out and, and replace demonic systems with new systems. We weren't equipped to organize righteousness in such a way that it became systemic and shifted culture. And that's when I began to put my energy into training the laborers. And the Bible says that Jesus shared this same dream. He looked upon the people. He described them as dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. And that was no insult to shepherds. And this is no insult to shepherds and pastors of today. Jesus, of course, was the greatest shepherd of all shepherds. And even he said, the people, the nations, the people are dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Therefore, pray, so there's the prayer piece, pray the Lord of the harvest to Ekbelo, to send out laborers. The problem wasn't with prayer for us or our movement, and it's probably not a problem for you. But the problem was with the appropriate training and equipping beyond just discipleship in the Bible and who Jesus is, as good as that is, real strategic systematic training and equipping that allowed laborers the skill set, the know-how, the wisdom of Daniel, the wisdom of Joseph, to be able to go out and impact society. And so that's what we began to do. God was gracious to us and gave us a gift in the form of a very important training and equipping system that we have seen now work in various countries and even Canada. And uh, now I'm seeing results as a minister and I'm so happy about it. But we began to organize righteousness. So what is organized righteousness? Organizing righteousness is essentially taking the principles of the kingdom of God and not just acquiring key positions in society, but creating wineskins. Let's use a spiritual term. <laughs> creating wineskins uh, that can hold 
and extend God's kingdom into those seven sociological spheres. When I say wineskins, or what am I talking about? Organizing the work that we do through charities, through starting ministries, through establishing platforms of influence, and creating social programs and ministries that extend the church, that remove the walls of the church so that sons and daughters of the kingdom are in society and occupying. This is the key to truly occupying. It's, it's great to see people come to the church and be saved. But while we're waiting for the masses to come, let's go to them. But we do it in an organized way. One of the ways that you can create a program or organize righteousness is by choosing a problem in the community, choosing a issues that, that we, the church, can go and extend our hand to, that we can solve. One of the major keys to societal transformation is meeting needs. Picking a need and meeting it. <laughs> and organizing a program to mobilize others to go and meet that need. That's a very crucial piece right there. That's one way that you can begin to organize righteousness. And we began to do that, in fact, out of our church. We've seen incredible societal transformation in a way that we've been able to now take to other nations in the world. One of the things we did was we, we built a system of training that allowed for a certain number of people to enter, be trained and equipped, and those that were faithful to the completion of that training system now had the tools, the keys, the endurance, the thick skin to handle what's actually out there when you go beyond the four walls. You know, the devil's very comfortable for us to just remain in our churches, remain in our church benches, but he gets really uncomfortable when you step out there in an organized way and begin to impact society. So that's what we did. And those that completed this particular system of intensive training, they now were qualified and we sent them. I use the word send because this is more than uh, evangelism. This is more than going out and handing out tracts and street witnessing and just witnessing maybe at your work. All of that is important. That should never change. We should never stop doing that. But we did something called systematic sending. We sent people out in an organized way to create programs and ministries that were like covert kingdom cells and kingdom movements. Uh, some people started charities and ministries based on uh, kingdom principles. One person I can think of, for example, is Aisha. Aisha Francis created a program called Project Restore Phoebe, which was using kingdom principles, but in a way that were not so overt. It was more covert, and her ministry uh, rehabilitates families impacted by incarceration. Well, when she launched this ministry, all of a sudden she was speaking on the the stage with lawyers and judges and the elite of society, bringing solutions to systemic problems in society. And the university took notice of her and began to send students as interns, and people began to help to fund this particular project. And she had no problem reaching out into the community with answers, with the kingdom. Now that, my friend, is discipling nations. That's that's the Great Commission right there. And people eventually, when they experience the love and the principles of the kingdom, more than experiencing a prayer meeting or even a wild service, as good as those are, when they experience that coming right to their doorstep, they want to meet the king of that kingdom. They want to meet King Jesus. <laughs> I think of another one of our graduates, Patrick Flontek, an older gentleman who, who said, I, you know, I sat in church for years, having never led a single person to Christ. Well, we helped him to organize righteousness. And he created a program for senior citizens and began uh, to oversee several uh, senior churches in the community. These were small groups of seniors in their seniors' home. That they had churches there, and he became radically a part of that. And, and he began to lead people to Christ, he said, almost on a weekly basis. They began to get saved, many before they would die and pass on. To glory. And so we had project after project like this as people began to organize the principles of the kingdom. So take Patrick, for example, what was the principle he organized? It was honor thy father and thy mother, honor our seniors. And he dreamed of building a movement that would honor this, the seniors of the society, thus inviting a commanded blessing 
upon that city or society. <laughs> and we have story after story like this as people began to go out and organize righteousness. And it began to impact, literally, the mayor of our city. He heard about what was happening. And uh, we actually went as an organized group of involved citizens and went to his office and presented a gift to him and even said, we are here uh, as those who want to impact our city. And uh, he ended up presenting an award uh, to us and uh, basically saying, we welcome. We welcome you into this city. And, and I was really surprised by this award because... They at that time thought that there were hundreds of us <laughs> because the effect that organizing those programs had in the community was so systemic. There was so much in kingdom influence happening. People thought there were hundreds of us. And guess what? Here's my shock. At that time, there were only 13 of us graduates there. <laughs> uh, only 13 people were mobilized in an organized way. Where do we see that this took place? Well, Jesus and the disciples. Imagine Jesus' strategy, the Son of God's strategy in impacting culture. Was, was was not building a mega church as good as those are, <laughs> and was not necessarily developing something over here like this, or a one place where you go to a Mecca, where you meet with God or something. And, and of course, the local church is important. We need the local church. It's the hub. It's the strategy center. It's the embassy from which we train and equip and send ambassadors. But I'm making a point of a principle here. Jesus actually organized 12 individuals, and you and I are sitting here today because of the strategic impact of those specially trained and equipped laborers. It became so systemic, the world is still being impacted today by what that small group did. So we began to do this. We began to organize righteousness, and we encourage our graduates and different people to start a program, meet a need organize something around it, and the city and the society begins to take notice. Well, we started taking this over to places like Bulgaria, for example, and through our trainings there, through proper training and equipping, these laborers began to impact society to the point where they are saying we are seeing signs of tangible transformation in the country. There was so much impact, in fact, just over a three to four year period, I was invited uh, to speak at the European Judges and Lawyers Convention uh, on the role of truth in society, rebuilding a former communist society. My friends, we have the kingdom of God. We don't have to wait for it anymore. We don't have to just pray about it anymore. We actually can go and rebuild nations. We can disciple nations in kingdom principles if we will be organized. The world belongs to the organized. I love what Pat Francis said a while back. Uh, she said, uh, well, we were prayer walking the block. The Muslims bought the block and built a mosque. <laughs> Sometimes that can be the case where we commit what I call the sin of irresponsibility, where once we've prayed, now it's time to go out in a strategic way. And we should have continued prayer as we go. So we began to see this happen in Bulgaria. And I sat with the director of the uh, European Judges and Lawyers uh, movement there. And he said, you've been able to do more for Bulgaria, not even living here, than some people have done who have lived here all their lives. I don't say that as a point of pride. I say that as an example that even though Jesus isn't living here on the planet, we can go out with the gospel he's given us, with this strategy he can give us, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and take revival beyond the four walls and impact every level of society if we're willing to be organized and strategic. We began to also do this in a place God called us to called Namibia. We began to create or you know organized righteousness that really got the attention of the parliament there. You know, many of evangelic ministries, uh, evangelistic ministries were blocked out of coming into Namibia because the accusation was you uh, hold big crusades and you, you know, take up big offerings and leave, leave the country without paying taxes. That's what was said in general about some evangelistic ministries. 
But they said, we welcome you as History Maker Society into our culture because you are training and equipping Namibians to solve the problems of Namibia. Organized righteousness. Governments respect it, you know, and the people can't stop it. And you make kingdom principles to become trendy in society. That's what shifts culture. And the principles of the kingdom become systemic in every area. One of our graduates who I'm so proud of, she said, I sat in church for years waiting for my release to go and do something. She received the training of, you know, how we train and equip laborers in a certain way. And uh, she ended up creating a curriculum that helps educate families who are being impacted by this perverse sexual um, curriculum that's coming down the pipe here in Canada. Within six months, this curriculum has now been in over 36 countries and counting. She made a curriculum. That's an aspect of organizing righteousness. You know, curriculums, books, video trainings, charities, ministries, involvement, you know, everything from 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 NGOs all the way to, to programs for the homeless. Whatever you're passionate about, create a program for single moms, for, for new immigrants to the nation. Create a program, organize righteousness, and there will be no shortage of kingdom carriers carrying the kingdom of our Lord and Jesus Christ into every aspect and sphere of society until the nation makes the shift and begins to reflect the kingdom of heaven. And that's what I want to cur encourage you with today. Many times we say things in hope, and we say things in prophetic, especially the charismatic community. We will say, okay, we prayed, and the nation has shifted. Well, okay, let's also be people of reality and wisdom. Let's see the shift. And if it hasn't shifted yet, what do we need to do strategically to begin to turn the momentum that's currently happening in Canada going the wrong direction? And it is a momentum. It's a momentum that's a result of many, many years of people who carry demonic ideologies and, and citizens who are organized, who've been more organized than the church, have been systematically over a period of time creating a momentum, steering an entire nation the wrong direction. Now we, the church, have the difficult task of not only getting organized and beginning to get involved and show up, but to actually also be strategic in how we do it. And not just the big leaders across the country, but every person in our churches, every average individual can be part of this movement of turning a nation back to God by taking what you have in your hand, by taking your skill set, by taking your call and ability and taking your, your uh, understanding and wisdom in how to solve a certain problem and by getting involved in an organized way. Every person, not everybody can lead the, the conference, not everybody can lead the prayer meeting from the stage, but everybody can organize righteousness, even if it's just organizing things on your street to bring kingdom principles to your street. If you're trained and equipped in the right way, we can shift a nation because now we have the task of steering the nation against an already progressive moving momentum. And it's questionable even whether we're in time. But with God, all things are possible. But while we're waiting on God to show up and, and send a revival from west to east coast and east coast to west, west and north to south, while we're waiting on that, let's take what God has given us as strategic kings and priests, judges of the earth, managers of the earth. Let's, let's fill in the gap from prophecy to execution. Let's fill in the gap from prayer to action. And let's begin to mobilize in a strategic, organized way. I'm sorry, but history has taught us the world belongs to the organized. And the world belongs to those who go out and, and take action. So I want to encourage you with that today, that organized righteousness is actually the key to reaching nations. There are whole continents that pray longer than you, that <laughs> fast more than you, yet the continent is in systemic poverty to this day and, and all kinds of stuff. And I don't want to venture too far into, into that today, in the sociology of nations, but I want to encourage you that there are enough believers, there are those God has called who will pray and act. 
We have to pray as if it all depends on God, but work in an organized way as if it all depends on us. God bless you.